Hey friend, if you're trying out watercolor for the first time, I've got a few pointers to help you get your bearings and know how to get started with watercolor. So if you're ready, let's dive in. The first place I always start is with good supplies. You don't need to go to the art supply store and break the bank. Um, some good places to start is to, if you had to pick one area to invest your money in, my vote would be brushes and paper. Um, the paint you can invest and grow in your collection of paint over time. Like I have 12 different colors in my palette that I use. I know this looks like a lot more than 12. Um, some of these colors I don't use and some of these are repeats. But uh, the main place that I would start is with your brushes. I love the Princeton Heritage 4050 series. They have another good watercolor brush from Princeton is the Aqua Elite. Um, anything that has sable in the name or is made for watercolor is going to be a good watercolor brush. You want to focus on with brushes, you wanna focus on how well it bends and then snaps back into its form. So when something so when a brush is wet and you're using it on paper, you want uh, the ability to be flexible so I can push on my brush for a thick stroke, but then I can release my um, pressure and it snaps back to its round tip form. So that's one thing that you wanna look out for when it comes to Watercolor brushes is the snappiness, the flexibility. You also want a brush that holds a lot of pigment and water. So the Princeton Heritage series or the Aqua Elite, which is actually engineered to hold a lot more water and pigment um, from Princeton are really great at holding pigment and water. So you're not having to re-dip in water and um, pigment so frequently. So totally up to you and your style. But my number one suggestion, if you're just getting started with watercolor is to um, invest most of your budget in your brushes if you are on a limited brush or a limited budget. And then your paper is also important. So you want to um, make sure that you're working on 100% cotton paper. I use cold press paper. Some watercolorists use hot press paper. I have a video that goes over the difference between cold press and hot press if you want more details. Um, but the reason why I use cold press paper is because of the toothy texture and it helps keep the it helps keep the water and the pigment in place. So if you're new and maybe you've started to notice certain things like um, a backwash or blooms happening that you don't particularly like. So like when this dries, there will be a hard ringy line on the lighter wash there. If you don't like that, that's gonna happen more frequently on hot press paper because hot press is smooth. Cold press is toothy. There's still gonna be a lot of um, balance that you need to incorporate with the consistency of your water and pigment ratio. But basically, if you don't want these um, weird rings to happen once this dries, you can see it. Cold press paper is gonna give you a lot more freedom to, to get away with um, that not happening as much. So paper, brushes, if I were to spend the majority of my budget, it would be brushes and paper. And then obviously you can work your way up to 12 or 15 or however many colors you want in your palette. Um, but having good quality pigment is important. So I don't know about you, but I, at you know school when I was a kid um, during art class, they would bust out those like really cheap rose art or Crayola like dried pigments of watercolor and they were just really pale. They didn't really provide the magic that you can now, that you have with really good quality paints. So I use Winsor & Newton professional level watercolor. If your budget is really tight, there's no wrong in starting with Cotman student level paints or some watercolorists who are very, very skilled even only use Cotman level paints and never have you and like never use professional level. So it's really, it's really up to the artist and what their preferences are. I just find that um, the professional level paints from Wins Windsor Newton allow for a lot more brighter color. There's less filler and binding agents in the mixtures. Uh, more pure pigments, so they're more expensive, but they are also gonna give you more vibrant color. They're gonna give you a lot more fun blending. So like this phthalo turquoise color or cobalt turquoise color that I have in my palette is one of the more expensive colors I have in my palette. And it's just a really beautiful turquoise. 
So I love investing in this color because this color turquoise is pretty, pretty impossible to mix by hand without actually having the mineral from the pigment from the tube cobalt turquoise. So I buy this one. It is an investment, same with Opera Rose. Opera Rose is a bright neon pink color that I'm definitely running low on in my palette. Um, but it's a really pretty, it's a really pretty bright pink color. It's even brighter than that normally, but I am very, very low on it in my palette. Um, so there's gonna be some colors or pigments that you can't really mix up like a neon pink or a bright turquoise. So I'd recommend buying those tubes of paint if you are really drawn to the vibrant colors or you want turquoise and bright pink in your palette. Um, but you can always just start with the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, if you are on a, a limited budget. So starting with watercolors, it can seem overwhelming when you're walking into an art supply store and it also can add up in the price tag department. Um, so start where you, can, where you can. If you are super limited, I would start with a size six round brush Round brushes give you a two-in-one stroke. So if I use a slanted hold with my brush, I will be able to use the, the width or the belly of the brush. So that will give me a wide stroke. But then if I tilt my brush straight up and down, I'll get a thin stroke. And my size six is just more versatile. It's gonna give me really thin and smaller strokes, but also if I wanna fill in a bigger swatch or area, I can you know just spend more time coloring it in. If I start with just one brush and I go for the bigger brush, the size 16 brush, then I can't really get those smaller details. So the size six brush is by far my favorite brush. And if you were to only buy one brush, it would be this one in my opinion, if, you, if I were you. Um, and then making sure that you understand slanted holds or flat holds and um, vertical holds, especially with the round tip brush because it's a two in one stroke brush. So you can get fat strokes, thin strokes, fat strokes, thin strokes. And the angle of your brush is really going to affect the shape of the stroke. So keep that in mind as well. So for a slanted hold, you're gonna get more of a wide stroke. So I've got a really close angle with my brush to my paper and I can get a much thicker coverage if I slant my hold or I use the belly of my brush versus a vertical hold, which will give me a thin stroke. And with vertical holds, you can put little to no pressure, medium pressure, and obviously the line will get thicker and thicker the more pressure you apply. So when you're doing a slanted hold, you're gonna get more of a straight edge because you're pointing the point of the brush towards the edge of the stroke. So if you want a straighter edge, you would do that for a thick stroke. But if you want it to be tapered or more like an oval shape, then you would point the brush down in line with the stroke instead of perpendicular. So the angle of the brush is important with both the angle, the handle of the brush is away from the paper and also positioning. Okay, so the next thing that you wanna be mindful of if you're trying watercolor for the first time is the fundamental techniques, and that's gonna be wet in wet painting and wet and dry painting. So with watercolor, you're painting not just with paint, but with water and paint. And obviously there's gonna be different consistencies with the more amount of water you have on your brush versus pigment um, or the less. So that will, that will, change the opacity of the color. The more water you have on your brush or in the mixture, the more transparent the color will be on your paper. And the less water you have in your mixture or on your brush, it's gonna be thicker and more opaque. Um, but wet and wet painting is just as it sounds. It's when two areas of wet pigment or water touch each other or are layered on top of each other you're poking. So there's three different methods for wet and wet painting that you can do. And I'm loading up with some Prussian blue that I have in my palette. This is one of my favorite blues. Um, but wet and wet, you can, this is a very thick mixture of Prussian blue, so it's less, it's less transparent. But with wet and wet painting, you can push, poke, or pull 
So for this first one, I'm gonna pull starting at that bottom edge of that Prussian blue with just water on my brush. And I'm gonna pull that pigment down. And that's gonna give me a nice soft gradient or blend. So this can be used with um, shading and more realistic paintings. So if you wanna show a soft gradient or with seascapes painting the water, I use this technique a lot, pulling my darker colors into my lighter colors. Then you can also push using wet and wet. So again, I'm just applying Prussian blue. You can do this with any color and any consistency. And I'm gonna grab yellow because if I were doing this with two similar colors, similar in hue or similar in contrast or value, you wouldn't see it. So I'm gonna start with yellow away and I'm gonna push the color into it and the yellow will kind of burst or bloom into that blue. So that's pushing. Pushing is used for, I use it a lot for my more abstract paintings where I wanna show a really obvious burst in color. Sometimes I'll use it in florals. Um, like this one here, I have the blue, this cobalt blue is bursting or being pushed into the pink flower. So it really is, a, is more of a preference thing if you like to show those blooms. Some people don't and they want it to be more realistic. So they'll do the pushing or the pulling method. But if you like to show those little blooms and bursts of color, I like to um, force that kind of with the pushing method. And then the last method you can use for wet and wet painting is called poking. So I'm just gonna lay down a swatch of clean water. You can also do this with lighter colors or medium mid-tone colors. Um, and poking is used for adding little dots or details um, gradually on um, a wet swatch of pigment or water. And the more water you have on your, on your pigment that you're poking into the wet swatch, the more it's gonna spread. So this one has a little bit more water than these dots over here. So they're gonna be bigger and they're gonna spread more. You can also sit on one dot or area to make it spread even bigger. But I love doing this technique if I'm painting like a abstract background, this kind of looks like shibori dye or marbling, um, but you can use it in your realistic paintings if you wanna add little dots or bits of texture on flowers or in landscapes, um, it's perfect for that. And then the next fundamental technique, so you have wet and wet, the next style of painting that you can do with watercolor is wet and dry. So this is exactly as it sounds as well, but wet and dry is when you layer a wet layer on top of a dry layer. So that can be dry paper or it can be dry pigment. When you're working with watercolor, you're working light to dark. And so it's the opposite of mediums like acrylic or oil where you're working dark to lights because it's opaque and you can layer whites and lighter colors on top of darker ones without it being um, absorbed or not showing. So with watercolor, you're gonna work light to dark. So you're always gonna start a little bit lighter and then go to your mid-tones and then your darker tones. So with wet and dry, this is when you would use um, and get your crisp, details so they're not going to be blurry and blending like um, wet and wet technique will give you they're going to be crisp hard lines so you can layer on top of the underneath and add shadow details i did it for this painting here where i had a lighter green leaf waited for it to dry and then layered a darker green on the outside um, also, these pink details here, I was able to layer on top of the blue flower because the, the blue flower dried and so it didn't burst into the blue like this one did here. So this blue, these blue petals were, were still wet, these ones were dry. So if you want your dots to be more crisp and not to spread, wait for your base layer to dry. But if you want them to burst and show blooms, you don't need to wait for them to dry. That's called wet and wet. This is wet and dry. The next thing that you need to think up, think about when you're trying watercolor for the first time is to focus on basic shapes and developing muscle memory. So my favorite exercise to do, my favorite exercise to do when someone is first starting out is just to practice circles. So circles, 
are going to help you practice um, twirling your brush around with your fingers and not moving your wrist or arm. This is uh, your stabilization. This is your stabilizer, your way of stabilizing your strokes so that they look more clean. Um, and you can develop more stability and confidence in, in swirling in this motion with swirling and developing that muscle memory. So for a circle, I'm gonna use a vertical hold. So my brush is pointed straight up and down and I'm going to not move my wrist and just swirl my brush around. And then from there, I'm gonna use a slanted hold. So my brush is about 25 degrees away from the paper and I'm gonna put medium to heavy pressure on it so that I can fill in that circle as quickly as possible and have smooth coverage. So you're going with the vertical hold and a slanted hold. And then practice kissing or getting really, really close to that circle, that first circle you painted, but not touching it. So you're paying attention and practicing detail or getting really careful. So I've just got water on my brush here. And then once you fill in that circle, you can expand the outline. So it just barely touches the blue circle. Most beginners will just swirl right over that blue and really layer over their first circle. So make sure they're just barely touching, like their shoulders just kind of bumped so that you can um, practice getting those clean strokes. And if you want that to burst even more, you can push more Prussian blue into that circle. So this exercise is really good for developing brush technique and muscle memory. And I can do another like maybe yellow circle. It's also a good exercise in helping you understand how colors cooperate and work with each other. Understanding color theory is another biggie for if you're just getting started with watercolor, with any medium actually that requires color. It's important to have a good understanding at some point of how colors work together because you're gonna be mixing up colors, you're gonna be using colors on the same piece together. And it's really important to know their relationships. And in the complete beginner's guide to watercolor that I have is it's like an over two hour video. Um, we cover some color theory stuff along with a bunch more on these topics. Um, but when it comes to color, you want to understand moments of contrast. So this dark blue next to this bright yellow is creating a lot of contrast, but also this dark blue next to this super, super light blue is creating a lot of contrast. So we have contrast with color and contrast with value. And then you can have contrast with complementary colors. So blue and orange are complementary or contrasting colors. So swirl, practice that swirling motion over and over again and filling it in. And then gradually increase the size of the circle so you can just barely, barely graze. And you can push. So blue and orange are contrasting colors. This is bright and dark contrast. But again, more of this stuff is in the complete beginner's guide to watercolor. But this exercise is really, really good for developing your comfortability with your brush, seeing how it works and how it spreads when you put different levels of pressure on the brush as you're swirling it around and filling it in. So practice these circles or bubbles, whatever you want to call it, over and over again. And they're just really therapeutic to paint too. So then my fifth tip for if you're trying watercolor for the first time is more of a motivational speaking moment. And it's on practicing patience and progress over perfection. So it can be really overwhelming. Maybe even right now you tried painting some of these circles and they came out super wonky and you're getting disappointed. If this is your first time or first few times painting like this, you have to remember, I never started like this. My first circle looked like a blob or 
blurred together and layered too much, wasn't super crisp and um, smooth outline. So make sure you focus on patience and progress over perfection, no matter what stage of the game you're in, even 10 years in to watercolor painting, I still have to focus on progress and patience over perfection because there's so many times like I'm trying to get really good at painting loose, I almost called them pistachios because I had a parakeet that was named pistachio, loose parakeets in watercolor. And they've been really frustrating me. I've got one good parakeet that I painted out of like 12 that are not good. So you need to focus on progress and patience over perfection because that those little incremental steps of growth over time are really going to compound over time and you're going to be so grateful that you didn't throw in the towel um, because again, I would love to never paint a bird again in my life because they're so hard. But I know that if I just stick with it, I'm going to nail it. And so are you. Then the last thing that I would suggest if you're trying watercolor for the first time or you're brand new to watercolor, 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 um, is practicing compound strokes. So with our circles, we practice simple strokes, a vertical hold and a slanted hold. But a compound stroke is when you combine the two in one shape or one swoop. So that would be for leaves. So a compound stroke is gonna look like where you start with a slanted hold and you're gonna end with a vertical hold or vice versa. So for a leaf, this is a good um, subject to practice for compound strokes. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna give it a little stem first, but then with my brush angled about 75-ish degrees away from my paper, I'm gonna put pressure and then gradually release that pressure. So with these round brushes, you can get really fat and then when you release that pressure, it'll get thin again. So pressure, release, pressure, release. Or if doing the leaf is too complicated because remember, this is your first time, it's going to look wonky. It's probably gonna look like a little butt with no skinny tip. So you might even need to practice just gliding over your paper like you're barely touching it with a vertical hold so you can get used to what it feels like to have these really, really thin strokes out of your round tip brush. And the smaller your brush is, the thinner these lines will be. So you're going pressure and then releasing that pressure and getting little to no pressure like you did up here with these thin strokes. Pressure, release, and meeting one side, the top side with the bottom side. But if leaves are getting a little too complicated for you practicing this um, compound stroke, just do one side of a leaf. So if we're coming down here, again, starting about 75 degrees away from the paper, and I'm also making sure my handle or my brush is in line with the direction I'm painting. So I'm not perpendicular to where I'm painting, I'm in line. So pressure and release, and just drag it out so you can get used to how that feels going from pressure and release pressure, release. And if you're just starting out and you're seeing that you're mostly just focusing on the pressure, make sure you're really dragging out the thin part of your brush so you can get used to how that feels. And then all you're gonna do from there is combine that stroke twice. Pressure, release. Start at the same spot on the bottom and the same spot at the top and then you have a leaf. Um, compound strokes are used a lot in brush lettering because you're gonna have thick strokes on your down, down stroke. So like if I were to write cat, anything that's going up or across is gonna be thin and then down strokes will be thick. Pressure, release. Pressure, release. Pressure, release. Pressure, release. Pressure, pressure. Oh no, I'm running out of room. And that, my friends, is your basic, if you're trying watercolor for the first time, 
dipping your toes in the water of watercolor. Um, those six things are super helpful to keep in mind if you're first starting out. Make sure you check out the Complete Beginner's Guide to Watercolor if you want a deeper dive into all things beginner watercolor stuff. Thanks so much for watching this video. Obviously that was a brief overview of what to expect with watercolor or how to get started with watercolor. But if you want a really intense, deep dive, in-depth lesson on all the things you need to know for getting started with watercolor, everything from the two techniques that I listed, we go a lot more in depth on wet and wet technique, wet and dry technique, supplies, color theory, color relationships, and a lot of different things like strokes, compound strokes. And I show you all of that in an in-depth lesson that's over two hours in the complete beginner's guide to watercolor. We'll link to it in this video and in the description below. So make sure you check that one out. Highly recommend. It's one of our most popular videos on this channel. And then I also have a free download for you on watercolor that will link in the description of this video so you can just send us your email so that I know where to send it and you can download my free ebook on watercolor basics and getting accustomed to watercolor even more through a little cute little free pdf ebook. Also I have a playlist on my channel so just click on my little icon my little profile photo photo <laughs> So just click on my little profile photo and you, you can then from there click on playlists. And I have a watercolor basics playlist that is just for you if you're just getting started with watercolor. Highly recommend just getting lost in those videos, watching all of them because they're gonna be so helpful for you. So thank you so much again for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.